Hey, good morning, everyone. Great to be with you all this morning. Man, a lot's been said this morning already. I could probably just start preaching right off of what Shaw just said, you know. And uh, But it, honestly, when you think about what you guys believe and how uh, this ministry is being led and the principles that it has, um, it's a lot to ask. I mean, it's a lot to ask to, hey, lay aside your own desires and live for Jesus. Do everything that the Bible says. Don't sin. Lift each other up. Don't accuse one another of sin unless you take the speck out of your own eye. That's a lot, isn't it? Yeah. it? It is. It's a lot for any man or woman or child or anyone to try to live up to. But the good thing is, is that you have a God that doesn't let you walk that path alone. Amen. And you have a Holy Spirit that's with you to guide you and to give you wisdom, to encourage you, to help you when you come upon the struggles of life that you undoubtedly will. Amen. You undoubtedly will. And as the days get more difficult and more dark and you see it happening in our society all over, your walk and your faith is going to be challenged even more. And so in order to, to be the man that ISI is trying to mold you to be and in order to to live out the biblical principles that you've been reading about and studying about during your Bible studies, you have to be, in my title slide here, you have to be after God's heart. Amen. You have to. There's no other way, okay? You have to be out uh, after his heart. Um, before I get into this, I just want to tell you that when I look around this room and I think about where ISI was when I first went to a meeting, I think in 2018, just to give you an idea, talking about Jesus and the Bible were kind of taboo, if you will. It, it wasn't mentioned. Reading your Bible, talking about going to church, those things weren't talked about because there was a fear of, of chasing somebody off or turning someone off. But after Ted has stepped in and changed that philosophy, given God the glory, opened the pathway for Jesus to have his way, you guys have multiplied in a way that I don't think he even believed could happen. So I'm, I'm grateful for that. But today we're talking about after his heart. And if you have read your Bible at all, you know that this was something that was said about David. David was considered a man after God's heart. So let me give you a little context here, if you will. Um, in Acts chapter 13 and 14, we've been studying that at my church. So Paul and Saul, or Paul, if you will, and Barnabas, uh, the Holy Spirit says, hey, set these guys apart from me and for the work that I have for them. So they get hands laid on them. They get sent out. Paul goes on his first missionary journey. So he travels to this area called Antioch, Pisidia, and this is all in chapter 13, if you will. And when he gets there, he goes to the Jewish synagogue and they, they know who he is. They say, hey, come in and give us an encouraging word. This is what they asked of Paul. This is what I hope to give you today, an encouraging word. So as Paul gets into this in uh, around the middle of chapter 13, around verses 17 to 21, he starts reminding them of all that God had done for the Jewish people, how he chose them, how he brought them out of Egypt, how he led them in the wilderness, how he gave them the land as an inheritance, how he gave them judges, how he gave them a king that they had been looking for. And it was a reminder to them of God's loving kindness. And this is what he wants you to know this morning, too, that in spite of all the obstacles you're going to encounter in all the challenges that you're going to face in the days, weeks and months ahead, he wants to remind you that of his loving kindness that he's there for you, that he wants to minister to you, that he wants to walk with you, that he wants to guide you and help you walk out this faith that you've claimed as your own because he understands that it is going to be difficult and it gets more difficult as the days go ahead. So Paul is recounting this Old Testament story. The Jews would have known about this because they were, they were astute, uh, dedicated students of the Torah, the Old Testament, if you will. They knew about this inside and out. But then Paul is talking about this and he doesn't really dwell on any one point until he gets to uh, these set of verses, verse 22 and 23. Go ahead and move that forward. He says this, he says, and when he had removed him, Saul, 
he raised up David to be their king of whom he, God, testified. So this is God's testimony about David. He says, and said, I have found in David, the son of Jesse, a man after my heart who will do all my will. Of this man's offspring, God has brought to Israel a savior, Jesus, as he promised. So if you're new to the Bible, you know that David was son of Jesse. He was a shepherd boy. You know that in Samuel, God sent Samuel to anoint him to be the king. David grows up. He challenges and kills Goliath. He becomes king of Israel. He goes on and have this horrible affair with Bathsheba, has her husband killed. He repents for that. And we're going to talk about that part a little bit later. So this is in essence who David was. But today I want to zero in on three virtues that David had that I believe is going to help you be the man that God wants you to be and to help you to walk out all the things that both Shaw and Ted have said are requirements for ISI, okay? The first one is humility. Now, David spent a lot of time alone with God. And this is where he came to rely on God. This is where he came to understand who God was. This is where he came to know God's heart. He spent a lot of time alone in the wilderness tending to these sheep. Okay? And it was in these times alone where he developed this humility, where he realized, I can't do anything. I can't be who I want to be. If I'm going to do or be anything, I have to submit to God. Okay? I have to. And it's a message for us today. If you are going to walk with God and you are going to be the man that God wants you to be, you must humble yourself to God. And how do you do that? By purposing in your heart that you're going to know him through his word and that you're going to submit to what it says in his word. You have to do that if you're going to be a man after God's heart. And, you know, the interesting thing is it says that that God found in David. Well, God doesn't need to find because God knows everything. He knew everything. This is why we call God omniscient. This is one of his uh, eternal attributes. He knew everything in eternity past, now and eternity future. And he knows it all at once. OK, there's nothing hidden from him. So he didn't have to go and look and say, hey, let me look for somebody on the earth that I want to make king. That word found is equivalent to the word examine. So what he did was he examined David's heart. And in David's heart, he found him to be a man who was humbly after his own heart. He examined. In fact, when Samuel went to anoint David, um, they brought out one of David's brothers who was this tall, big, strapping guy like Dan here. And... Um, God said, hey, don't get caught up in Dan's looks, okay? Yeah, he's a player. He's got the look. He's got the stature. I'm just messing with you, Dan. He's got the stature and the look and everything, but don't get caught up in that because man looks on the outward appearance, but I, God, examine the heart. So God's going to examine your heart and find out where you're at. And if you are who you say you are, if you're living the way you say you live outside of these four walls. But it was during this time alone that David developed this close relationship with God and developed this humility that he had in his heart. The second thing that I want you to see about David is his faithfulness to God. His faithfulness to God. Okay. David's faithfulness, in spite of what happened with Bathsheba, he messed up, you'll mess up, I'll mess up. But in spite of that, God still said, he's a man after my own heart. In fact, in verse 22, it said this about David. God said, I have found in David, the son of Jesse, not only a man after my heart, but who will do all my will. Are you willing to do all God's will? You're reading his word. You're studying different books of the Bible. You're coming together. You're praying. You're understanding the word. 
But the question is, are we willing to do all of God's will that's found in his word? That is the challenge, to be able to do that. After all, it's in God's word and it's in times of prayer that we come to understand what God's will is. God has a will for you wherever you're at in life. He has a will for you as a husband. He has a will for you as a father. He has a will for you as a friend, a worker, a business owner, a, a, a server in the church, a, a member of ISI. God has a will for you in all of that. And in order for you to know that will, you've got to spend time in his word and you have to spend time in prayer so that you can hear from God. Okay, it's important that you stay faithful to God, know his will and be willing to live out his will in your life. So this this tells me that I have to be more than just a hearer of the word, more than just a reader of the word, but I have to read and hear with the intent to do. To, with the intent to do. We have to be intentional about saying that I'm going to do what God has called me to do. And the last one, and this is a big one for me, and I, I really want to elaborate on this one this morning. The third thing about David that I want you to see is about his repentance. His repentance. You know, the Bible says that when, when in Acts 13, 36, it said, now when David had served God's purposes in his own generation, he fell asleep. In other words, he died. But the Bible writes about that. It said that he had served God's purposes. And so we see in David's life somebody who served God's purposes in his own generation, which is a testimony of his walk with God. Okay? He served God's purpose, not his own. Now you might think, okay, what does that have to do with repentance? I'm glad you asked. And so here we find the word and the meaning of repentance as uh, not simply an act of remorse or an act of duty. OK, so you're walking along in life. You come in contact with the things of God. The things of God challenge how you live. It challenges your perspective of the world. And you realize that you're not doing things or living the way God wants you to live. Maybe you're engaged in whatever it could be that's not, that's not pleasing to God. And you come to this point where you realize, I've got to stop doing this. I can't live this way anymore. So I want to repent, okay? So then you decide, okay, I'm going to turn away from that thing that I was after, I was chasing after, whether it was alcohol, pornography, uh, whatever the case may be that traps that men fall into, pride, I'm going to turn away from that thing and I'm going to go in a different direction. OK, that's repentance in a sense, turning away and going in a different direction. But the question is, what direction are you going into? What are you going towards after you repent? After you decide, hey, I'm remorseful about how I live my life. I'm remorseful that guys know that I'm involved in this, that, or the other. I'm remorseful about it. I want to turn, but what am I going to turn towards? You see, we can be remorseful about our sinful condition, and we can repent out of sin and still not turn to God. There's, if you attend church on Sunday, even in this room right now, there are men who have been remorseful about how they've lived their lives and the things that they may have done, but still have not completely turned towards God. So the top five things that distract us when we pray or when God is calling us to read his word or spend time alone with him, the same five things that distract us from that are the same ones that distract us from our walk with Jesus. And so here we have Jesus standing in the center. And he's saying, OK, you were going in that direction. Now you're going to do a 180 and come back this way. But what are you coming back to? So what are those top five things? We say, God, I'm not going to I'm not going to do this thing anymore. I'm not going to drink anymore. So then maybe I'll start chasing after money. 
Maybe money becomes my God now. I'm going to work harder. I'm going to get another job. I'm going to store up money. I'm going to see how much money I can make. I'm going to start another business venture. I'm going to take on a part-time job. I'm going to do this and that so that I can have more stuff. And that way, if I pay attention to my stuff, I won't be over here looking at the pornography on the computer. I'll just be tied up with my stuff. And Jesus is saying, hey, repentance, I'm right here. I'm the one that you need to find. Or maybe we turn from the thing that we were involved in and we started getting involved in media. And when I say media, I mean we're watching television more, we're on Facebook more, we're on Instagram more, we're doing all these things. And Jesus says, hey, I'm right here. You said you were repenting. I'm waiting for you to come to me. Or maybe I was going to have some guys hold these, but uh, Danny told me I had to stay in this little square here. He <laughs> said, don't go out of that square or you'll get sniped. <laughs> or maybe I turn to church and religious stuff. Okay. Maybe I say, oh, I'm just going to start going to church more. I'm going to start going to ISI more. I'm going to start going to somebody's group more. I'm going I'm to even start serving. I'm going to start working in the parking lot at, at CCV with Ted. I'm going to start doing those things. And they look good on the surface, but our heart is not really here. So we've said we've repented, but we haven't turned to the one who gives us the forgiveness. And then the, the other thing that we turn to is maybe we turn to our relationships. Maybe, hey, I was, I was caught up in looking at stuff on the computer and for pornography and stuff like that. Well, hey, you know what? I'm just going to pour myself into my wife. And then my wife becomes my idol. And Jesus is saying, hey, man, I need you right here. I need you with me if you're going to do and be who I've called you to do and be. Relationships. The kids come first. The wife comes first. Maybe relationships at work, work come first. And all of this after we've repented and said we weren't going to do the thing that we did before, but then we turn to something other than Jesus. And then the fifth thing, the last thing, is our routines. Well, I'll just bury myself in my routine so that way I don't get distracted and I don't have time to go focus on that other nasty stuff because that stuff is bad. So my routine is good. So I'll just focus on my routine and my routine becomes my idol. My calendar. The stuff I plan to do during the week or on the weekend. But Jesus is saying, men, if you're truly going to repent, then you must shuv. Shuv is a Hebrew word for repentance. And what it means is, it means not only to uh, purpose in your heart that you're going to go in a different direction, but that you're going to go towards Jesus. Okay? Towards Jesus. I want to share with you one last uh, couple of verses. And David wrote this psalm. David wrote, a lot of the Psalms when he was in times of trouble. And he, um, he wrote these Psalms at a time of distress, but he realized where his heart was during those times of trouble and those times of distress. And it's Psalm 51, verse 10 through 12. He writes this. He says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. So this affair that he had with Bathsheba and killing her husband, her husband killed on the battlefield to cover it up. It really haunted him for a while. He was very remorseful. But instead of turning towards his kingdom or his possessions or even his other concubines or whatever, he turned to God and he asked God to help him with these things. Created me a clean heart. This is a plea to God to do a miracle in him to fix his heart's desires, to make him more holy. 
Holiness begins with a condition of the heart. Renew a right spirit in me. Renew is a plea, much like uh, calling on God to restore. God, give me a spirit that you can be pleased with, not my own. I no longer want to follow my own spirit, God. I want to follow the Holy Spirit. And then he says, cast me not away from your presence. Cast. So in his mind, there's a real fear of being a castaway from God, a castaway, almost like being on a raft floating out to sea with no power, with no direction, just at the mercy of, of the wind. David was afraid of that. He didn't want to be someone who just drifted aimlessly through life, taking on whatever came at them. He wanted to get back on a path with God. And then in verse 11, he says, take not your Holy Spirit from me. David, remember, when Saul was king, Saul was disobedient to God, and God pulled the Holy Spirit from him and gave him a spirit of torment. And David's like, God, I don't want to go through that. I don't want to go through that. Don't take your Holy Spirit from me. And then he says, restore to me the joy of my salvation. How many of you that have been saved for a while remember how happy and joyful you were when you first gave your life to the Lord? But then that kind of, kind of, it kind of fades after a while because we get distracted with the things of life and we, you know, we start putting Jesus second and our, and our salvation doesn't mean as much to us now as it did in the beginning. I want to encourage you this morning to go back and remember why you got saved, how you got saved and who saved you and find that joy once again. This is what David was doing. And then he says, uphold, it, uphold me with a willing spirit. David recognized that in that moment of weakness, his spirit was unwilling to be obedient to the things of God. This is what drew him towards Bathsheba, caused him to have the affair with her. An unwilling spirit. So he's saying, God, uphold me with a willing spirit. Uphold me. Lift me up above the darkness. Lift me up above the sin. Lift me up above disobedience and do it by giving me a spirit that's willing to obey your word. Men, you have a great challenge still ahead of you, regardless of what age you are. But you also have some next steps in God, regardless of where you are in your walk with him. You have next steps. And in those next steps, I want you to consider not being specifically who David was, because David messed up. We all do. But I want you to consider that in my next steps, whatever direction that Jesus takes me in, I'm going to make sure that he's at the center. And if you will put Jesus at the center, he will give you all the things that David asked for here in Psalm 51. He'll give you a clean heart, a right spirit. You'll have its presence. You'll have the Holy Spirit. You'll be joyful in the salvation that's yours. And you'll have a spirit that's willing to follow after God and be a man after his heart. Let's pray. Father, I thank you today for the men of ISI. I thank you for the great distance that you brought them from, from being the men who they were before to the men that they are now. But God, we know that there's much work still to do in the hearts of your men. So I pray today that they would have hearts that are open to hear from you, hearts that are willing to obey you, hearts that are willing to live up to the reputation and the character that ISI is trying to establish in them. And just as you watched over David and guided him, I pray, God, that you would let these men know that, that you're not looking for perfection, that no one, no man has walked the earth in perfection since Jesus went home to be with the Lord. But God, it's not perfection that you're after, it's direction, and it's direction towards you. And so I pray today that men would find you at the center of their every endeavor so that they can live and be and do all that you've called and placed in front of them. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Morning, men. Um, thank you, Larry. 
Uh, Larry's talk today after his heart, he had three things he brought up, humility, faithfulness to God, and he mentioned that that's not just knowing God's Word, but doing God's will, what we learn from God's Word, and repentance to be the man that God wants us to be. Isn't it satisfying and glorious to know God has a plan for us? You know, we have a plan for us, but God has a plan for us. We just have to get on board with His plans. He mentioned five things that distract us. Money, routine, media, religion, and relations. And we've got some questions so we can dig a little deeper on those things. I think that one of his points that I wrote down is a small positive change. As we look at these five items that could hinder our prayer life and could hinder our walk with Christ, a small positive change can make a big positive improvement. So as we evaluate our life, think of something small you can do if you can eliminate something that's negative or do something that's positive, that's going to have bigger impacts down the road. <clears throat> I'm reminded of a story just in the last week or two I heard. I'm, I follow the Milwaukee Bucks. That's my, my NBA basketball team. And, um, yeah, you already know you're laughing. Uh, they had the best record in the NBA. They had one of the best players, Giannis Antetokounmpo, the, the Greek freak. And they hit the, the end of the season and the best record in the NBA – so it was a mountaintop experience. Their team's finally healthy. They go in the playoffs, and they're playing the, the lowest-seeded team, and they got beat four games to one. So it was very disappointing. They ended up firing that coach now. And uh, after the game, the last game they lost, and they got eliminated, a reporter asked the Greek freak, Giannis, was this a failure? And he, he was kind of frustrated, and he kind of – kind of. Um, shattered down the report a little bit, but then he said, you know, I consider this a step to success, not a failure. And I, I thought that's a lot like our spiritual life. We can have a mountaintop experience one day, and then we can so quickly have a low point in our walk, <clears throat> and Satan's there to whisper in our ear to separate us from God and to give us guilt and separate us, and the Holy Spirit's there to draw us back to God and nudge us back to God. And Psalm 51 is a really good tool when you're at that point when things aren't going as well as you'd like or you've, you felt like you failed or you thought something you shouldn't or you did something you shouldn't or said something you shouldn't. Psalm 51 is a good psalm to meditate on and bring you back to God. So uh, thanks again, Larry, for bringing that wisdom. We have these talks recorded on Saturday morning. So you get a chance to see him later today or over the weekend, send him to a friend, someone that you feel could be blessed by it. In addition to Saturday morning where we have about 150 men from different denominations, different ages, different churches from around the valley, uh, we have our Tuesday and Thursday Bible studies, we have an addiction recovery group, we have a discipleship program, we have a golf ministry, we have one coming up um, Friday the 12th, that's it's filled up already but it's a good time to fellowship. And after t this morning, we have some men that meet for breakfast at Village Inn at Four Corners if you'd like to continue the fellowship. Right now, we're going to break into small groups because we want to know what you have to say about these things. So there's a, the three questions. If you're a group leader, red tag guy, someone's going to lead the discussion in your group, make sure you have these questions to help start the discussions. Take a few minutes and rearrange the chairs. Please try to keep your groups five or six. If they get too big, it's a little difficult for everyone to get a chance to share. Be blessed. Be safe. Thank you.